Well, good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word concerning the parable of the sower this morning, but before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Do me a favor, during this online meet and greet, send a link to everyone you know. Let's get as many people watching our online services on a weekly basis. All right, I'll see you on the other side. Good morning, I'm CC Family. I'm so glad you could join us this week for our online service. Today I want to talk about the insider difference, and we're going to talk about why the disciples received from Jesus it was, as he was opening up the parables to, the, to them, and, and why others were kind of on the outside looking in. And maybe you've, you've noticed this, maybe you haven't, but if you have a dog and you walk them, you notice that they're sniffing all kinds of things. And you're kind of like, what is the deal, right? And and I know my dog, uh, my got a little chow chow puppy that is just, you know, he, he sniffs and he snorts like a pig. He's hilarious. But I mean, he can sit there and just go in an area and just go nuts on that. And, and what's interesting is dogs, uh, their sense of smell is like the human sense of sight. In other words, what they're going to draw upon is the sense of smell, whereas humans are going to draw upon the sense of sight. That's just kind of how God made us. And it's interesting, in our sinuses, we've got about 6 million different receptor cells. But for the average uh, beagle, they've got over 300 million, 300 million receptor cells <clears throat> in their snouts, meaning they got 50 times more. So whereas we'll kind of walk down a street and we'll get a faint glimpse, you know, a hint of maybe a, you know, a flower or something like that, you know, your dog can smell every human and every animal and every dog and cat or whatever that's been on that road the last day or two, right? In other words, their ability to perceive in the area of smell gives them an insider's edge over humans, right? And, and you know, you, we all know this. If you ever had friends that are really, you know, musically inclined, they got a great musical ear or their voice is perfectly in pitch, or people that have, you know, that, that have incredible emotional intelligence and they can really pick out if somebody's struggling. Uh, I'm not that person usually. <laughs> My wife is much better at that. In other words, certain people have certain giftings and skills um, based on what God has given them. And of course, in the animal kingdom, for sure. You know, based on the, the, the basic, um, you know, the way God is, has wired uh, animals and humans. And based on that, certain people have an insider track on understanding things and seeing things and perceiving things and knowing things. And so as we come across the parable of the sower again, we're going to dig into that again this morning. And we're going to come across a section uh, where, where Jesus basically... Um, makes a distinction between those that are on the inside and those that are on the outside. And there's a difference for those that are on the inside, those that can truly receive from the kingdom, hear what Jesus is saying, receive what Jesus is saying, understand what he's talking about. And so we're going to get into that this morning. So I encourage you, if you got your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Short section of scripture, a lot here. When he was alone, and again, he had already given the parable of the sower, but now he takes the disciples and a few others aside separately. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Father God, as we get into your word this morning and we talk about the insider difference, God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants to reveal to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about this. What are you doing? What am I doing with this opportunity to be an insider with Jesus? Because when we come across this section of scripture, we see the disciples and a small group of people that were pursuing him. Um, they were self-selected. In other words, it wasn't so much, I mean, yes, the disciples were called. But many of these others, we don't have any record, at least from the scriptures, 
uh, that they were called. They were choosing to get close to Jesus. They wanted to be in the, on the inside, not on the outside. And if you've ever been on the outside, you know, in a social setting or in a group, you know, we all remember the cool kids club <laughs> or the cool kids table at lunchtime or something like that. You know, it's always awkward. It's always different. It's always, you know, weird if you're not, if you're not on the insider table. And I remember my first um, uh, glimpse of what it meant to be an outsider as a non-Christian. Never thought about, about it before. But in eighth grade, uh, and I wasn't a Christian then, um, there were some friends of mine that were Christians. And I remember sitting at the lunch table and, and, and one of the gals that I was sitting you know, at lunch with, she was singing a Christian song. And I'm like, hey, kind of cool, cool tune, what is that? And I remember this and it really rubbed me the wrong way against Christianity. She said, hey, this is a Christian song, but of course, you're not a Christian, so you wouldn't even know what this is all about. And, you know, I, I'm sure it was, you know, typical 13-year-old, 14-year-old girl unthinking, just saying something. But I was kind of like, well, gee whiz, if that's, if that's what it means to be a Christian, uh, and, and you make those that are outside feel kind of secondary in some way, shape, or form, I don't need you. But of course, I gave my life to the Lord two years after that. But, you know, you, we all know the feeling of, of, of being an outsider, uh, or wanting to be on the inside and wondering about it. Now, at that time, I wasn't really wandering, wanting to be on the inside. I was more turned off by Christianity and this particular Christian. But it, it, it motivated me later on in life to begin to pursue that as far as pursuing the Lord and drawing near to Him. I, I remember when we were, Christy and I were ministering in Illinois at the church in Illinois, uh, we were talking about, this was, gosh, 2013, 14, something like that. And you remember those, uh, those, those big moons, those red moons, those blood moons that were out there. And we were talking about the end times in one of our youth group meetings, and we were having just a kind of a really cool rap session. And I remember one of the gals who was very worldly, <laughs> who was very hard and hard-hearted. This really got under her skin. And this really challenged her to where she was like, how do you know you're in? Because she didn't want to be left behind, right? She didn't want to be left behind at the rapture. And, you know, we were talking about all those, you know, pretty intense things, which is really fun to do with teenagers that, quite frankly, need to get a little, you know, fear in them of the Lord. But she was very prompted, how can I know I'm on the inside with God? How can I know? And it was, it was a really powerful conversation. And so in this section of Scripture, we see the insider difference. Again, look at Mark 4. Verse 10, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. And that's the key. The key is if you want to be an insider with Jesus, you've got to choose to come to him for explanations. You've got to choose to not be indifferent toward him about what he's teaching, what he's revealing, what he's speaking. And you begin to pursue him individually and say, Lord, I want to know more. I want to understand more. I want to learn more. I want to grow more. I, I want to know more about these king this kingdom. And of course, as he's talking about the parable of the sower, which we've already talked about last week, you know, it piqued their curiosity and he didn't explain it. In other words, when Jesus first spoke this to the crowd, he offered no explanation. It was just straight up. The sower is sowing seeds, the various soils, that's it. But we see the insider difference because those that truly have a heart for God will begin to seek him for answers. They do not remain indifferent or passive. And we see a couple of scriptures, particularly in the book of Proverbs, that really characterize this seeking after wisdom. Proverbs 4 verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. It speaks of pursuit. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and you apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, and if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. That's it. That, that's the insider difference. Real simple, real easy is that you have a quest, a thirst after God. You have a thirst after knowledge of the kingdom. And just like you pursue a treasure, you with reckless abandon are serving Jesus and you're spending time with him and you're desiring more of, more of him. You are the one that you're going through the scriptures and asking the Lord to speak to you. You're searching through commentaries, perhaps. You're digging deeper in a lexicon. You're, you're digging deeper in maybe a Greek word study. You're going beyond surface 
reading and you're digging in deep, these are the ones that more and more and more kingdom revelation will be given, okay? But then there's the outsider difference, right? <laughs> is that, you know, these are those that do not regard what Jesus is saying about the kingdom uh, to be important at all. And, and see, there's something in, in Christian ethics called axiology or value theory. Without getting too technical, it simply means this. People value things, right? We've got money. We've got precious metals, right? You've got gold. You've got diamonds. You've got bank accounts, savings accounts, stock you know, stock brokerages and things like that, right? Humans value things. And, and, and what we see here is the disciples were valuing Jesus and his words very highly. And the outsiders, who were the outsiders? We've already talked about this in Mark chapter 3. These were the religious leaders who were offended at Jesus, who felt threatened by Jesus, who were rejecting Jesus. These were the family members of Jesus that basically because of a spirit of familiarity, did not regard him as a prophet, did not regard him as the son of God. And so they valued him less than the disciples and these others. And, and I'm reminded of the classic statement from Thomas Paine in his short little book, The Crisis, speaking of the value of freedom at America's founding. He said, what you obtain too cheaply, you will esteem too lightly. Tis dearness that gives everything its value. So for the disciples, Jesus and his words and his kingdom, they were very dear to him. So they pursued him and asked to the, to, to the religious leaders, to Jesus's own family, they did not regard him well at all. So they, so they missed it, right? And, and the scripture says this in Matthew 13, 46 and 45 and 46, Jesus likens the kingdom to a pearl of great price. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when you found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. See, humans are desiring creatures. Uh, as, as, uh, as one author says, humans are like existential sharks. We are, cons we are desiring to consume. We are desiring to be satisfied. We are desiring to be satisfied with God, a craving that the Imago Dei, we are made in God's image. We're made to reflect God. We're made to be, <clears throat> excuse me, image bearers. So we're going to long for that. We're going to long for that pearl of great price. We're going to keep seeking after many times lesser things until we find the living God. And these disciples were those that were searching after the living God and they found him and they began to seek him and pursue him. But by, and they were insiders, right? But by contrast, the outsiders don't look at that pearl as a pearl of great price, but instead they consider it something on the equivalency of, well, trash. Because if you look at Matthew 7, verse 6, Jesus says this, speaking of those that reject the kingdom. Don't give to good dogs what is sacred and don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under your feet and then turn and tear you to pieces, right? So, so there's a valuation difference here. Those that valued Jesus obviously esteemed him, esteemed his words highly and received. Those that devalued Jesus, devalued his kingdom, rejected him in some way, shape, or form. They treated the pearl of great price as something equivalent to some form of trash. They missed it. They were on the outside. And, and so what we're seeing here is, is, is there's the distinction being made. And what's interesting is just because you are on the inside doesn't mean you're going to stay on the inside. Because you could become someone on the outside if you don't have ears to hear. Look what it says in Luke 8, 18. Jesus says this, Therefore take heed how you hear. For whoever has, more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. And so so-called insiders can be outsiders. And we see this even in Jesus' disciples. Now, in Mark 4, it's all looking great, right? They're hanging with Jesus. They're receiving from Jesus. They're asking questions. They're getting understanding about the parable of the sower. <clears throat> but if we go later on, <clears throat> excuse me, in this gospel and the other gospels, we see that disciples dazzling <laughs> incomprehension of what Jesus is saying. And we see their blindness. Jesus rebukes them for being blind. And we see the failure to grasp the cross and the resurrection. So much so that at the end, right, one of his disciples becomes a traitor. 
and betrays him. Another denies him and all of them flee him when he's on the cross. So let's remember, just because you are an insider doesn't mean you can't shift to be an outsider. That's why Jesus says that be careful. Therefore, take heed how you hear. Luke 8, 18. Take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. And so that, that's a sobering warning here. But here's the good news. Outsiders can become insiders. Because even as the disciples wavered throughout the Gospels, we see a lot of outsiders that suddenly became insiders throughout the Gospels. Just some quick examples. The women with the issue of blood pressed through and received from Jesus. The Syrophoenician woman, the woman that was a Gentile, right? That Jesus said, listen, you know, throw the, throw the crumbs of the dogs. And, and she responds with Jesus, well, hey, li, li, at least, you know, at least th there's some crumbs there. I, I'll be willing to go after a crumb. And, and you can go on, you know, the, the, the exorcist that did not follow the disciples, blind Bartimaeus, the woman who anointed Jesus, the, the Roman centurion. So, so the crux of the matter is to have an insider's perspective, you got to have ears to hear. To have an insider's perspective, you've got to be willing to pursue Jesus, to ask, to question, to query after him, to value him, to esteem him more than anything else. Those are the ones that truly receive. Those are the ones that are on the inside. But we got to beware, <laughs> just because you're on the inside doesn't mean that your ears won't become calloused and dull and you'll miss God, right? And so that begs the second point here, or, or brings us to the second point, and that's simply this. What kind of reception do you give kingdom truths? What kind of reception do I give kingdom truths? Because he says in Mark 4.11, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but those on the outside, everything is said in parables, right? So to you is given the mysteries of the kingdom, right? The, the peoples that are healed, the, the demons being cast out, right? The, the, the disciples, the small following here, they're receiving. The you is correspondent to the good soil that Jesus has already talked about. These are those that bear crop 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. Is that through the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, they're able to receive what the Lord is saying because they have eyes to see, eyes to see and ears to hear. This is why Jesus says to Peter in, in Matthew 16, 17, when he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. That's a great example of a good soil Christian, right? Someone who is on the inside, someone who is open, whose heart is open. This is exactly what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 12, he said, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of, who is of God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. So the good soil are those that have ears to hear, eyes to see. The good soil are those that question Jesus, that value Jesus above all else. But then by contrast, Jesus says, but to those on the outside, right? <laughs> These are the ones that miss it, right? These are the three bad soils in Mark 4, 4 through 7, right? These are the ones of whom the Apostle Paul says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, because they are why? They are foolishness to him because he is spiritually discerned, right? There, there's a dullness over their eyes. There's a dullness in their ears. They, they can't receive everything that God has for them. So that begs the question, which one are you? Where are you at? How receptive am I? How receptive are you to what God is trying to reveal? Because to those that are on the outside, right, the religious leaders, the, the family of Jesus that basically rejected him, at least at this moment of his life, we see them throughout the Gospels in confusion. They're questioning. They're forever misunderstanding. And the final consequence of this is that if you maintain spiritual dullness, you'll actually get to a point where you want to kill Jesus. And that's exactly what happens with these religious leaders. It says this in Mark 4.12, so that they would be ever seen but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And Jesus is referencing Isaiah chapter 6, 9 through 10, which is closely related to Isaiah's song of the vineyard. And it's all about the Jewish people who, because they refuse to hear, 
because they rebelled against God. They became calloused. They became hardened. They stopped bearing a crop. And God said, I'm going to judge you. And the parallel Jesus is drawing here with these religious leaders is you're just like the, the, the Old Testament vineyard. You are just like the Jewish people that rebelled against God, closed their hearts, were on the outside looking in, and you made yourself ripe for judgment. And the interesting thing here is that they literally, through their rejection of Jesus, sought to kill Jesus and ultimately did kill Jesus and yet unwittingly opened themselves up to God's master plan of redemption for the entire human race. So God was always in charge. Uh, you know, God was always sovereign all along. But this, this, this brings us to, to something that's really sobering. And I'm not saying we're going to literally try to kill Jesus, but how many of us, how many times have I, because of rebellion? because of becoming hard-hearted, becoming closed to the Lord, perhaps, in some area of your life, you killed the work of God in your life. You, you short-circuited something that God wanted to do. You short-circuited a blessing that God wanted to bring about in your life because you became hardened. You didn't have eyes to see. You didn't have ears to hear. You missed God. Now, God's gracious, God knows how to clean up messes. His grace is able to clean up and restore any mess we make if we come back to him in repentance and faith. But again, let's just, let's just stay on that theme right here. <laughs> is that what, 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 what Mark is trying to say is, if you stay hardened before the Lord, you're going to short circuit the work of God in your life. You're going to miss God. You're going to kill the work of God in your life. And so we always, always, always have to have ears to hear. We always have to have eyes to see. And again, this section of scripture is one of those, okay, what does that mean to be an insider? What does it mean to be an outsider? To be an insider is somebody who has ears to hear, eyes to see. To be an insider is somebody that questions God, that pursues God, that runs after God as buried treasure, as a, as a pearl hidden in a field, a pearl of great price. You value him. You value God more than anything else. To those on the outside, you devalue that pearl. You consider that pearl worthless in some way, shape, or form. You just kind of become indifferent to it. But the problem is when we do that, we move away from the Lord. We move away from his blessings and we miss out on the grace of God that could be ours. So as we close this morning, I want to leave you with, a, with, with at least four areas of application that we need to be considering. First of all, you and I are as close to Jesus as we want to be right now. Where do you want to be? If you're not as close to the Lord, my challenge to you is move closer. My challenge to you is begin to start pursuing him. My challenge to you is repent, turn and come toward him, move toward him. Because the scripture says of these religious leaders, they became so dull that they weren't even able to turn anymore. And we don't want to get so much earwax in our ears that we can no longer hear the Lord and receive from him. Second of all, where's your heart? Is your heart soft before the Lord? Is it hardened? Is it pliable? Is it resistant to the Lord? Again, our ability to be on the inside, our ability to receive is contingent upon that, right? Are we just hearing the word or are we, just, or are we heeding what the word says? Because somebody who really is after God is not content just to hear the word. They want to understand and they want to do what it says. As James says, faith without works is dead. That's very, very important. And finally, and again, soberly, but, but, but this is important. Are you and I inadvertently short-circuiting the work of God in our lives because of rebellion, because of indifference, because of becoming spiritually lazy? And again, this whole section of scripture is, is about our heart condition. And, and, and our ability to receive or not receive from the Lord. And so really, so much of what I'm talking about here, it's up to you and it's up to me to really look inside and go, God, where am I at? How close am I to you? Is my heart hardened toward you? Am I open to you? Am I, am I, am I willing to do what your word says? Have I short-circuited something you're wanting to do in my life because of some form of rebellion or resistance towards you? Again, I can't answer that question for you, and you certainly can't answer that question for me. But what I can do as I close is pray for all of us. Can we do that? Father God, I thank you so much for your word this morning. And this is one of those locator sections of Scripture. It locates us. 
What does an insider look like? What, what does that inside look look like? It's a heart thing. It, it's a valuation thing. It's a pursuit thing. It's a yieldedness thing. It's a questioning thing. And Father God, my prayer for every single one of us is that God, we would have ears to hear. We would have eyes to see that our hearts would be inclined toward the Lord more than anything else so that God, we can enjoy that insider's look and receive from everything you have for us so we can grow and mature and be fully formed followers of Jesus. I ask and I pray for this now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, it was great to be with you. And until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.